Well, good morning. I uh, wanted to update you on a couple prayer requests, things that have come across the email and text line for us as a church and as a pastor this week. Um, as many of you probably heard, Joe Hewer passed away earlier this week, and I believe it was on Friday that his wife Donna also passed away, both from the respiratory um, virus that's been going around, uh, it's believed. And I heard this morning an update from Sue Daly that Sharon Burke uh, fell this morning and has been taken, or last night, sorry, last night she fell and has been taken to St. Anthony's, a uh, possible stroke, they're not sure. So we'll keep you updated as a church as we find out more information. But be praying for Sh Shirlene, for the Hewer family, and for many other things that are going on in our world. We need to know that God is aware of them, but we need to remind ourselves that we need Him. <laughs> Prayer is for our benefit more than it is for God's because God knows the desires of our heart and the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf. But there's something about us entering into a time of prayer that says, God, I need to be reminded that you're in control of even this. <laughs> and so we ask that you would continue to be praying and we will keep you updated as things come in. If you want prayer requests to be shared with our community, please email us, Hillside Crown. .org. We would be happy to share that out to our prayer group. It's not meant for us to carry burdens alone. <laughs> burdens are meant to be shared and helped, and the church is that helper. It is that community. And so I praise God for allowing us the opportunity to be together, to be sharing things together, and um, to have an opportunity in this time to inform one another of our requests and our praises. So continue to bring those in. I know my heart's been overjoyed by the prayer meetings we've had, um, but there's still things that will come today, that will come tomorrow, that we'll need to pray again about. So we can't live in the successes or blessings of the past, but really moment by moment, praying without ceasing, the Bible says, coming before the Lord. Let me uh, take a time in this uh, moment to do that, to come before the Lord and bring these requests and others before Him. And then we'll open our Bibles and look at a message from uh, Mark chapter 14. But let's pray. Father, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for the opportunity that we have today to be your people and for you to be our God. It's easy in the midst of the busyness and the craziness and the confusion for people to say, where is God? But we know that you are where you should be, on your throne. <laughs> we know that you are aware of our needs, that you intercede on our behalf, that you sustain all life, all things, and you are worthy of our praise. So remind us even now that you are God with us. Remind us even now that you are worthy of our worship, of our allegiance. It is in Jesus' name that we pray, the King of all kings. <laughs> Amen. Well, this morning, we're going to continue in a series in Mark. And uh, <laughs> I'm reminded my daughter and son are right now in digital school. School has been canceled the rest of the, the year in terms of physical classroom but there's still online classes going on. And one of the first things my daughter gets in an email is uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Many of us probably grew up in school doing the Pledge of Allegiance daily or often. But I grew up in a church also that during our midweek services and vacation Bible school, we also did a Pledge of Allegiance to the Bible. We did a Pledge of Allegiance to the Christian flag. So there are many things that we in our lifetime probably have pledged allegiances to. <laughs> and whether you believe it or not, whether you've verbally said it or not, you are pledging allegiance to something in every decision you make, in every choice you choose. We are pledging an allegiance, a following, a I am guaranteeing myself to support and help in any way the decisions made by this thing, this people. We could, we could debate which allegiances are better, 
But ultimately, we will see today that there are two allegiances that we can choose when we are under pressure. That's what I'm calling our sermon this morning, is allegiance under pressure. And we're going to see from the scripture what people do when they are under pressure. Just so you know that you're not alone or uh, devoid of this reality as well, my guess is over the last week, you've sensed a tremendous amount of pressure. <laughs> maybe financial pressure, maybe pressure that you need to go to the, ho the hospital for something, but you don't want to go because there's people that are sick there, or you need groceries, but they're out of the item you need, and there's just a lot of pressure. Well, the people we're going to see in Scripture this morning are not um, devoid of the pressure either. In fact, the first two verses of Mark 14 give us our context. We've been following the life of Jesus, as Mark's told it to us from the beginning, um, all the way till now. And we see in verses 1 and 2, it says of Mark 14, It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him, Jesus, by stealth and kill him. <laughs> For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And so there's tremendous pressure by those around Jesus. Politically, there are things happening that there's just some uproar and some movements that they want to take Jesus down. <laughs> But it's also a time of celebration. The Passover was a remembrance of what God did for the people in Egypt. And so this is busy and confusing, just like we might be feeling this morning. <laughs> There's just a lot going on. But God is still God, and we still have an opportunity to pledge our allegiance In Mark 14, we're going to look at a question that I want to answer this morning. And the question I want us to ask is, where can we give our allegiance when under pressure? And I mention this as an optional question, because it's not a have to. It's not a, uh, you already made this decision. It's present tense, we can pledge our allegiance to these things, and we'll see it from the scripture this morning. The first thing I want us to see is that we, under pressure, can give our allegiance to God. And this is the best option. This is one that we as Christians know to be good, know to be true. This is Palm Sunday, and whether you have a palm leaf or not, it celebrates the King is coming. The King is here. And so Palm Sunday celebrates Jesus as our King, and as King— he is worthy of our allegiance, worthy of our praise. But there's an example from Mark 14 of a person doing this, a woman in worship. So let's look at verses 3 through 9 of Mark 14 this morning, and we'll see a great example of this allegiance. Verses 3 through 9, And while he, Jesus, was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper— as he was reclining at table, a woman came <laughs> with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly. And she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There, there were some who said to themselves and indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? <laughs> for this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 Denari, denarii and given to the poor, and they scolded her. But Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me, for you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. 
You see, the woman gives us a great example of allegiance to God despite distraction. (laughs) Imagine Jesus is reclining at at a leper's home. First of all, for her to enter the home of the leper would have been uncommon in that culture. There would have been many a people that would have said a leper is unclean and unapproachable. So she enters this home where Jesus is, and she finds Jesus reclining at a table, uh, and he is who she knows him to be, the king. (laughs) They just celebrated it in the Palm Sunday, the palm branches, and they know Hosanna is here. And so she comes with this thing that she's really saved up for, that she's purchased with her own money, this costly ointment, this oil, and she takes it and breaks it no longer able to be saved or used for any other purpose. It has been spent. And she spends it on the head of Jesus. (laughs) Imagine the distractions she would have had by those around her. They even ridiculed her. What a waste of money. (laughs) You could have helped so many people. 300 denarii would have been like 300 days wages. You can equate what that's worth in our world today. But it was a costly sacrifice. But one she knew was worthy of being given. And one that while disciples and those in the room said, that is not how it should have been spent, Jesus affirms her act of worship. He says, she has done good. And what she says will be remembered and told on her behalf. Like, this is going to be her memory. (laughs) So under pressure, under distraction, we can give our allegiance to God as shown by this woman here. (laughs) Many of you might not be aware of this, but those of you that are know that this tomorrow would have been the final game of the NCAA basketball tournament. (laughs) And I bring this up not because basketball is what we're missing right now, but because there is a great picture of distraction. This picture is an image of a guy from Kansas, who I would cheer for if they were there, by the way, shooting a free throw at Texas University, away game for Kansas, and the fan's job behind the screen, the basket is to distract to make a lot of movement and make the basketball shooter miss the shot. So you see signs up there. You see people waving, and their job is to distract. And it takes tremendous focus for that basketball player to remove those people from his mind and focus on the basket and do what he's supposed to do, do what he's trained to do. We as Christians know that we should give our allegiance to God. It is what we've been called to do. We might even practice it in our rooms. We might practice it in community of church. But under a pressure moment, there are distractions around that want to make you miss. (laughs) There are distractions around that want you to change your allegiance, to not do what you are called to do. And so we start with an example in Mark 14 of a good thing. It is what we're called to do. But the question I asked was, where can our allegiance go under pressure? And it can, just like this basketball shot can either be made or missed. (laughs) We can either get it right in allegiance to God, or we can miss and not have our allegiance to God. I would challenge you this morning to remind yourself that God is worthy of your allegiance. (laughs) Remind yourself that as he has saved you from your sins, he is worthy of your life. But also be aware that there is tremendous focus that's needed. Tremendous uh, removal of the distractions to just say, it's me and God. And that alone is how we can be successful in doing what God calls us to do and doing what we know is right, (laughs) giving God our allegiance. Well, the second way that we can give our allegiance under pressure 
is we can give it to ourself. <laughs> Many people might say you could give allegiances to organizations or to uh, people, but truthfully, those choices are really an allegiance to self. <laughs> And we see in Mark 14 two examples of this in the life of Judas and the life of Peter and the disciples. And their decisions really are allegiance to self. Under pressure, we can say, what's best for me? <laughs> How do I avoid danger? How do I avoid problems? We can be in allegiance to ourself. Well, the first example that I want to see in Mark 14 is the example of Judas. And I'm going to jump around a little bit in Mark 14 in some passages, but I think they will help us to understand Judas's story. And then we'll backtrack and look at the story of Peter doing the same thing. So look at verses 10 through 12. It reads, Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him, Jesus, to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. Now let me pause there and just say that Judas was pursuing power. He was pursuing money. He was on the, the coattails of Jesus until the king-to-be declared that he was going to die. And then he jumped from that team to the next closest power team, which was the religious organization in Jerusalem. These were the political leaders of the country. <laughs> so to go from, I'm going to follow Jesus, to how can I make good with the people of the leadership of the church, of the temple, the priests, he goes and he helps them to betray Jesus. Jump ahead to verse 17, and we see that this time of Passover, this meal— Jesus is with his disciples in verse 17. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him one after another, Is it, is it I? He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And we know from other passages that Judas leaves the table and goes and is with the priest and prepares a guard. And we'll see that in verse 43. Uh, Jesus takes the disciples to Gethsemane to pray, and while he was there, in verse 43, and immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. <laughs> now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and they seized him. You see, Judas knew who Jesus was, but when the path that Jesus was taking them on didn't align with what he expected him to do, he changed teams. <laughs> Out of his allegiance to self, he wanted to be where the power was. And he didn't mind getting paid for it while he was there. Judas, through his betrayal, shows his allegiance not to God, not to Jesus, but to himself. We also see from here an example in the life of Peter and the disciples by Peter's act of his denial. Look in verse 26 with me. We'll see uh, an interaction between Jesus and Peter. Uh, again, they're at the Lord's Supper. Jesus is talking to them. Uh, and when they sung a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them as they're walking, You will all fall away. For it is written, 
I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. (laughs) But after I'm raised up, I'll go before you to Galilee. And Peter says to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. (laughs) And Jesus said to him, truly I tell you this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But Peter says emphatically, If I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same thing. You see, we see from Peter an intended devotion. He plans to stay devoted. His allegiance is with God, but it's not yet under pressure. And so Jesus says uh, that he will deny him. And when Jesus says something, we know it's going to happen. And so let's get to where that would happen in verses 50 to 52. Um, This is a unique situation, and we kind of wonder why is this in the book of Mark, but I think Mark is giving us a picture here. So in verse 50 it says, and they all left him and fled. This is after he's arrested. And they all left him and fled, and a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him. But he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. (laughs) This is the word of the Lord. But truthfully, many people ran away from Jesus with nothing. (laughs) That's the picture we see here. I believe there was an actual man, maybe Mark himself, I don't know, but many people were the picture of this young man who were with Jesus, were following him, but when they seized him, they, they run away with nothing. They desert him. And then we see this, Further, in verse 66, talking about Peter, Jesus is arrested. He's brought before some men that have power to decide his fate. And then we pick it up in verse 66. As Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You were also with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. (laughs) And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl Solomon began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again, he denied it. And after a while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and he wept. You see, Peter shows that in the chaos of arresting, he deserts. In the fear of what's going to happen to him, he denies. But in an awareness of what he's done, he's remorseful. (laughs) You see, our allegiance to self, Peter, I think, out of fear for himself, did things that he promised he would never do. Because under pressure, our allegiance can make us do things we said we'd never do. (laughs) It can put us in places where we wish we would have done differently, where we can be in remorse, where we can weep our decisions of denial. You see, Peter and Judas, for me, are not much different in terms of what they do and why they do it. But we know from Scripture that their response to what they do is different. But both men, out of care for themselves, Walk away, betray, deny Jesus Christ, the King, because things are not going as expected. For us here in Chicago, this is a common scene that we used to have to deal with when we were driving to work. (laughs) Maybe some of us don't have to drive down anymore because businesses are closed and things, but if you have the opportunity or... uh, the responsibility, the curse, whatever you want to say, of driving in Chicago traffic, this is a common scene. And if you look closely, there are four lanes of traffic. The semi-truck is in lane two, three, four to its right. 
And then there's a lane beyond the concrete wall called the express lane. Now, if you have an opportunity to drive Chicago and you get a chance to get in the express lane, you'll probably go faster. It lives up to its name. But one downside of the express lane in Chicago is that it does not allow you to exit until a certain time. And so many times, if you are found in a traffic jam in the normal highway, you can see the express lane as a way to relieve yourself of that pressure, of that traffic. And it's fine as long as you can get back to where you need to be when it's time to exit. But imagine this situation where there's a lot of traffic and you choose express lane and you go and the exit that you wanted to take is in the highway, not express lane. And you pass the exit. You see, so many times in our lives, we can choose what seems to be best. We can choose what seems to be easiest. But sometimes if we are not careful, God is asking us to get off at a certain exit and we can't because we have chosen what is easier for ourselves instead of following Jesus. Imagine Jesus is in a car in front of you and you're following him and you lose him or you lose sight of him or you think, you know what, this will be a better way. And then you see his car exiting and you want to follow him, but you can't. That's the reality for us as Christians under pressure we often look for easy ways out. But I'm telling you right now, there are some things in life that you will miss if you're in the wrong lane. <laughs> there are some things that you will miss if you are allegiance to self, not allegiance to God. For some people, that off-ramp will be eternity. <laughs> And, and God says, come with me, we're going to go to heaven. And that road that you're on, the express lane is headed to hell. And some people have chosen the easy path. The road is wide, <laughs> right? The gate is wide and it is going and it is easy, but it is not following God. And God says, hey, it's time to leave. And you've chosen a path that you cannot get off. It's possible. But maybe for us, the chance to be with God, our eternal exit, is down the road, and the express lane has a get-out-of-express-lane opportunity. We can get back to where the path is where God wants us to be before our time to exit. But this is not only true eternally. I think there are things in our own life that we choose to be in the path of ease and God's purpose for us to respond to our neighbor, to talk lovingly to my wife, to call my parents. I miss the exit because I've chosen a path that's allegiance to self, not allegiance to God. As I said before, we are in a time of tremendous pressure. And it's easy, it's natural for us to think about ourselves in a time like this, especially. But God calls us to consider others more important than ourselves. He calls us to lay down our life for a friend, to die to self daily. And that is how we have allegiance to God under pressure. You see, if we as Christians will live the Christian life and be in allegiance to God during this time, I think he has some places for us to go and minister. But if we are in the wrong lane, we might miss it. So may we devote ourselves, remind ourselves God is the king, worthy of being followed, even if this lane seems to be slower than another lane, even if there's more struggle, more pressure, more financial strain, the Christian life is not an easy one. But we can be with God. We can follow him and go where he wants us to go if we will follow in the lane that he wants us to be in. During this time of coronavirus, during this time of um, isolation and quarantine, I pray that you know that God is still in control. That God is still the king, the one making the decisions. 
the one worthy of our worship. So much of our world will say, where is your king now? <laughs> He's not here. And, and we can be distracted and we can choose, as Judas and Peter did, to change our allegiance. But my prayer is this morning that we're more like the woman at the feet of Jesus, worshiping him as he is worthy to be worshiped, sacrificing for him because he's worthy of our sacrifice. But the pressures cannot change what we know he's worthy of because we naturally would want to change teams. <laughs> my prayer for you, for all of us, is that we would remember that God is worthy. And we would remember that we who have been forgiven much have much reason to praise and worship and give everything to Jesus Christ. This next week, we're going to celebrate Good Friday and Easter. And though the church can't gather, it does not change the story of what happened. We so quickly will forget what Jesus did for us and find ourselves doing what we didn't want to do. May God give us opportunity to be reminded what we've been saved from, to be reminded what he has done for us, and as a response, find ourselves on our knees in worship to the king. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you this morning for the chance we have to hear from your word. We know there are things going on in our world that are tremendous pressures on us. And God, we know we have choices of how we respond to those things. So help us to respond to you, to follow you, to be your people, to be your children. God, thank you for being with us. Thank you for being aware of our situations and being present and acting in our lives. God, we just want to say thank you and praise you as the king, <laughs> the good king. We trust your will to be best. Help us to give our allegiance to you every day and every moment. Thank you for the opportunity we have to know your love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.